Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about energy changes in reactions. Energy changes are an important part of chemical reactions. The interaction of particles often involves a transfer of energy due to the breaking and formation of bonds. And in this video we will be looking at energy transfers generally. We will spend some time looking at exothermic reactions and endothermic reactions. And we will finish by looking at how we can investigate energy changes during chemical reactions. Let's start by taking a look at energy transfers during chemical reactions. Now, probably the single most important fact in this video is that energy is conserved during a chemical reaction. And so what that means is that the amount of energy in the universe before the chemical reaction happens will be exactly equal to the amount of energy in the universe after the chemical reaction has happened. And so what that means is that if a chemical reaction is transferring energy from the chemicals themselves into the surroundings, that must mean that the product molecules have got less energy than they had at the beginning. And it's that difference in energy that is being transferred out to the surroundings. So the chemicals might be losing energy, but the surroundings are gaining precisely the same amount of energy. And so what that means is the total amount of energy in the universe is staying the same. And that all we can do is transfer energy to the surroundings from the chemicals or the other way around, from the surroundings to the chemicals but the amount of energy stays the same. We're going to look now at two different types of chemical reactions that are precisely opposites of each other. And the first one is called an exothermic reaction. And in an exothermic reaction, the chemicals react together and then transfer energy out to the surroundings. And we can know that a chemical reaction is happening because if there was a thermometer in the beaker where the chemicals were reacting, the temperature recorded by that thermometer would go up. And that's because the chemicals are giving out energy to their surroundings. And since the thermometer is not part of the chemicals, it must be part of the surroundings. And so it will gain some of the energy that the chemicals are transferring to the surroundings. And so the thermometer will register that temperature increase. A nice trick to help you remember whether something is getting hotter or giving out energies to the surroundings is the actual name of the type of reaction. An exothermic reaction has got two parts to its name. It's got the thermic part, which means it is to do with heat, and it's got the exo part, which is like exiting. And so heat exits the chemicals. And that's how we recognise something as being an exothermic reaction. Heat exit the chemicals and the temperature increases. There are many, many different examples of exothermic reactions. So I'm just going to cover a couple of the most common ones. First of all, combustion. Whenever a fuel burns, this gives out tons of chemical energy to the surroundings. So they are very, very exothermic reactions. Less obvious, but definitely exothermic, are neutralisation reactions where an acid and an alkali react together to make a neutral salt, also exothermic. There are some slightly more common everyday uses of exothermic reactions as well. You can buy self-heating cans of hot chocolate or coffee or even soup where you press a tab and a chemical reaction happens that is exothermic. It produces heat energy and the drink or the food cooks itself. You can also buy hand warmers where there's like a little tab that you press and then an exothermic reaction happens and energy is released gradually and you can keep your hands warm when you're outside and that process generates a lot of heat energy. The second type of chemical reaction that involves an energy transfer is called an endothermic reaction. And an endothermic reaction is one where energy moves from the surroundings to the chemicals. And this results in a fall in the temperature of the surroundings. So there is a temperature decrease. 
And so the chemicals themselves has gained energy, but the surroundings have lost the same amount of energy. And so if there was a thermometer in this beaker and that thermometer is measuring the temperature, if it gives energy to the chemicals as well, its energy level will drop. And so that's why it records a temperature decrease. So endothermic reactions involve a temperature decrease because energy moves from the surroundings to the chemicals. Or a different way of thinking about it is if we explore the word endothermic, the thermic once again is to do with heat and the endo is very similar to the word enter. And so heat energy enters the chemicals and that makes it the exact opposite of an exothermic reaction where heat energy exits the chemicals. So endothermic heat energy enters the chemicals. Now there are far fewer examples of endothermic reactions compared to exothermic reactions, but there are, are a couple that you do need to know about. And the first one, by far the most common, is a thermal decomposition reaction. And that's where heat energy comes from the surroundings, from something like a Bunsen burner flame, and the chemicals decompose. That means they fall apart into their products and they have taken in energy from the surroundings. A second example is a reaction between citric acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate. And this reaction actually involves a decrease in temperature as those chemicals react together and pull in energy from the surroundings. Now, some everyday uses of endothermic reactions as well, really probably the most common is an ice pack or a cold pack. And so this is probably used for sports injuries and things like that. And so what happens here is you place the cold pack over an injury, such as a strain or an ankle swelling or something like that. And then you will again press a little stud inside the pack. And what will happen is the chemicals will start to react together inside the pack and the chemicals themselves will cool down and they will draw in heat energy from the surroundings, including the injured parts of somebody's body. And this makes it a lot more practical to have cold packs that you can trigger whenever you need compared to having to carry around blocks of ice in an ice pack. Far more convenient and practical. Now we can investigate energy changes that take place during a chemical reaction by carrying out experiments in insulated beakers and measuring the temperature change that occurs. And this works because the amount of energy transferred during a reaction is proportional to the temperature change of that reaction. So if you do an experiment, say, four different times, changing something each time, then the reaction where you get the biggest temperature increase is the one that has given out the greatest amount of heat energy to the surroundings. And the one where there has been the smallest temperature increase is the one that has given the smallest amount of energy out to the surroundings. And that can help you come to your conclusion in your investigation. Now, to do this experiment, you use an insulator beaker rather than a glass beaker because that will reduce heat loss to the surroundings, which is by far the biggest problem when taking measurements in an experiment like this. And so we use a polystyrene cup. Now, that polystyrene has got lots of trapped air inside it, and so that will reduce heat loss through conduction through the sides of the container. Now, we should probably also include a lid in our apparatus and that will reduce heat loss by convection where air inside the beaker moves away from the chemicals taking heat energy with it. Now we have a hole in the top for the thermometer to go through into the chemicals because we do need to be able to measure the temperature change but that lid minimizes the impact of heat loss out to the surroundings. And we could even put our polystyrene cup inside an additional beaker and maybe pack that beaker with cotton wool that's all fluffy and has got even more trapped air inside it and again that minimizes heat energy loss to the surroundings and so what that means is we can be really confident that the temperature change that we measure during our reaction is as close to the true value as it can be so we get the biggest temperature rise that we should get or the biggest temperature drop because this can be used to measure temperature decreases as well. Okay, 
That's the end of this video about energy changes during chemical reactions. Look out for more videos about energy reactions, such as the required practical that is for this topic. We'll also look at bond energies and reaction profiles in future videos as well. But that's all for now. Goodbye.